So we are on part eight of a series called The Life of Christ, and I was going to tie up some loose ends from the priest ministry, but I decided to to not do that and launch right into the ministry of the soon coming king. Um, Psalm 22 talks about his ministry when he walked this earth in the office of prophet. Psalm 23 is talking about his ministry now as a chief shepherd and also high priest. And that's the ministry that Jesus is in right now. We talked about that last week. And then Psalm 24 talks about Jesus' ministry as king, soon coming king. Psalm 24, 7, Lift up your heads, you gates. Rise up, ancient doors. Then the king of glory will come in. And in Isaiah chapter 44 and verses 1 through 4, It talks about when Jesus comes back, that he will actually enter through the eastern gate, also called the golden gate, when he comes again. So Jesus is king, soon coming king, but let me say that uh, he's king now. It's just that most people don't know it. When we say that Jesus' future ministry is, is soon coming king, Uh, We mean for the whole world, all right? And uh, again, he is king now, but not everybody accepts him as such. But there's a time coming, there's a day coming when Jesus will return as king of all the earth, and people will either rejoice at that moment, or they will mourn. Talks about that in Zechariah, and you'll see that in a minute. So Jesus promised us that he would return and take us to himself. And so we're going to launch into end time events. And to some people, this makes them nervous. There, some people get anxious about, you know, the rapture and the tribulation and end times and all this kind of stuff. I remember, uh, I mean, I was born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 17 years old. And... Uh, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, and I'm going through my 20s, and I I had anxiety about the rapture because I felt convinced he was going to come about 8 p.m. on my honeymoon night. I mean, I, you think I'm kidding, but I was anxious. I mean, I was, I was like, Lord, if you, if you love me even a little, you know, it's just, and I was, I mean, even that day, I remember like, <laughs> Lord, if you could just, and, um, but some people are real anxious about that kind of stuff, the rapture and the tribulation, this, that, and the other, but Jesus promised he would come and take us to himself. As I go into this series, I want to say this with all earnestness, I believe we're in the last of the last of the last of the last of the last days. I believe he is coming very soon, and there's some earmarks that tell me that it's very soon, much of which has to do with the nation of Israel. Much of it has to do from 1967 when Israel took possession of Jerusalem. Incredible prophecy. Much of it has to do with them coming back and becoming a nation on May 14, 1948. We'll be getting into that next week. But I'm convinced because of those type of signs and other signs, which I'll be talking about all this stuff. Uh, I mean, how do I say it? I believe it's very, very soon. All right, or whatever. John 14, 1 to 3 says this. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. King James uses the word mansions. I'd prefer a mansion over just a room. If it were not so, would I have told you that I would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you for over the last two thousand years? Jesus has been preparing a place for us for the last two thousand years. Prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There it is, right there. And notice the words in the next phrase. 
and take you to myself so that where I am you may be also. Take you to myself. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't denote that he's coming to where we are and staying there. It denotes taking us from where we're presently at, taking them to another place. So the wording is very intentional here. Jesus gives us another important clue in John 16. John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I, what? Go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. Some translations translations say the advocate, the, the comforter. We know it's talking about the Holy Spirit. If I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you and you talking about the church. The, the coming of the Holy Spirit is equated with his presence. Now, he was always on the earth as far as certain operations, but as far as the Holy Spirit's abiding, remaining residence on earth, that was connected to the church, and we see that on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given. Again, the Holy Spirit was there before at certain operations on the prophet, priest, and king, but uh, his, his presence as far as abiding and residing and remaining on the earth is connected with the church, the day of Pentecost. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit, all right? And, uh, but it's connected to the church, his called out ones. It's very important that you understand that point. I will send him to you, the church, not the world. The world won't get the Holy Spirit. John 14, 17 says this. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him. The world is unable to receive him. You'll get where I'm going here in a second. Because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you, talking about his followers, the church, and will be in you. So in that sense, the Holy Spirit wasn't given to the world in the way that he was given to the church at the day of Pentecost and forward. The Holy Spirit on the earth is connected to, as far as his abiding presence, to the presence of the church here on planet earth. Let me phrase it this way. Jesus leaves the church when he resurrected resurrect from the dead Jesus leaves the church, the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus comes back for the church, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth. It's kind of the reverse. It's the reverse, okay? It's the reverse. It's the reciprocal. So Jesus says, I'm here, uh, but when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come. And you're going to see that when he comes again for the church, takes the church the way the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth. When the church is taken away, something called the rapture, which I'm going to be talking about, in this sense, the Holy Spirit will be taken away as well. And on the reverse, the Holy Spirit taken away during the tribulation, and the church is taken away before that, and I'll get to that. But let's see that from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8, an amazing set of scriptures. Now, there's different views on this, but mine's right. Second, I'm just kidding around. Second Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 8. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. Now there's a phrase we need to pick up on. Our, our being gathered together to him. All right? We ask you, brothers and sisters, to not be easily upset or troubled. Now what happened? Again, this is Second Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians chapter 4... Paul talks about that Jesus is coming again. What happened was that the uh, church at Thessalonica got all upset because they thought that Jesus had already come and that their loved ones, uh, you know, what, what's happening with our loved ones because Jesus already came and what's, did we get left? And they're all bummed out. They're all, you know, they're all upset and they're troubled. So just a few weeks after 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes another letter saying, hold on, wait up, don't get all upset. This hasn't happened yet. So he says, you know, concerning our being gathered 
together to himself, I propose that that is talking about the rapture. Don't be easily upset or troubled by either by prophecy or by message or by letters supposedly from us, alleging that the day of the Lord has come, talking about the rapture. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless... Now, starting next week, I'll be getting into some more signs of the very end of the age, apostasy being one of them. Apostasia, from where we, a Greek word from which we get the word apostasy of falling away. Until the apostasy comes first. And the man of lawlessness, that's talking about the Antichrist. Again, I'll be, getting, I'll be drilling down into this a little bit uh, in the future. The man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, is revealed the man doomed to destruction. So that day can't come. The rapture cannot come uh, you know, yet because that, that Antichrist has not been revealed. All right. Then it says, uh, okay, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Verse 4, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God, object of worship, so that he sits in the temple, God's temple, proclaiming that he himself is God. Don't you remember when I was still with you, I, w- I used to tell you about this. And you know what current, now, now we get into some fun. And you know what currently restrains him so that he will be revealed In his time, there is something restraining the tribulation from starting. There's something holding back the Antichrist from kicking into power. What is it? And what's happening here? And actually, the you know what, the what currently restraining the tribulation starting. And the Antichrist from being revealed. The what is actually a he. Say what? Verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And the one now restraining will do so until he is out of the way. Talking about the Holy Spirit, I believe. Until he, the Holy Spirit, with the church at the same time. That's what I was talking about from the Gospel of John earlier, until he, the Holy Spirit, is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. So the sequence is that there will be a rapture. God will gather his true church to himself. The Holy Spirit will be withdrawn from the earth. He's the one that's restraining this from happening right now. The Holy Spirit... Again, he is now, the one now restraining will do so until he is taken out of the way. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit with the church, okay? And then the lawless one will be revealed. Can't be revealed until after that, and that'll kick off the seven-year tribulation. I'm teasing you this this morning because I'm going to get into more detail in the future. But sometimes it's easier to, to get the big picture first, and then you start plugging in the pieces. It's like putting together a puzzle. You know, if you have a picture of a puzzle, it's much easier to take piece by piece and plug it in if you have the picture of the puzzle staring you at the face. I'm kind of, today I'm giving you the big picture, and then starting next week we'll plug in some pieces and it'll make more sense, hopefully. So he is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is withdrawn from the earth, the true church, I repeat, repeat the true church, will be gathered together to Jesus and the Antichrist is revealed a seven-year tribulation starts we are not going to be there during the tribulation i'll show you more about this starting next week i don't but bible says in thessalonians we're not appointed to wrath and the tribulation is the wrath of god and it says as in the days of noah so it shall be with the coming of the son of man in the days of noah Noah and his family escaped the wrath he said the same thing about the days of lot In the days of Lot, Lot and his family escaped the wrath. That's the whole point of Jesus saying, so so like Noah and Lot, you're going to escape the day of wrath, and I believe the church will as well. Now, some don't believe that. Well, go for it. Stay through tribulation. I'm I'm going for the other, you know. I used to think that the rapture could not occur until the temple was built. And so uh, this, it's pretty far off because they haven't even begun. But that's, that's wrong. The rapture of the church takes place. Then the Antichrist comes into power. 
And he's the one that brings peace, 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 peace. And he gives the Jews permission to build their temple, which probably only takes a couple years, maybe three, whatever. But halfway through, he desecrates the temple, and that starts the last half of the tribulation. Again, we'll get into that. But no, the temple doesn't have to be rebuilt in order for the rapture to come. You know how many prophecies have to be fulfilled before the rapture comes? Zero. Now, there are signs that will lead up to that, and we'll get into some of those signs. I already alluded to apostasy and some other things, but there are some signs that will warn us about that, but as far as hardcore prophecies that need to be fulfilled, they've already done been fulfilled with Israel, and I'll show that to you. The rapture could occur any moment. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just getting started, so you know, I'll show you more about this. But there are signs that are leading up to that happening very quickly, and we'll, we'll dive into that, some more uh, prophecies. All right, Be, make mus, no mistake about it that Jesus is coming, and look what it says in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 12, where he, this is where, it's, I love this particular set of verses, because it shows some neat things about what Jesus is going to happen here. In, in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? And he says, at this time, because the, the disciples were always asking about that. Always. You know, what time, Lord? What time? Is it you going to restore? And uh, can, 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 you know... Can we sit at your right hand and all this? Just, Jesus is like, don't worry about that. And so Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, is standing from him, in front of them. And, and he says, you tarry in Jerusalem until you get the power of the Holy Spirit. And then they're going, are you going to restore the kingdom? When is that going to happen? And Jesus says, don't worry about that. Just stay in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And be witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts of the earth. So that's what he says, verse 7. It's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And after, and after he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching. Can you imagine what that must have been like? He's standing in front of, you, in front of them, and he rises in front of them. We're not talking about a ghostly spirit, Casper the friendly ghost, see-through type thing here. We're talking about, he's there physical in form, physical form, and he starts to rise and he gets taken up into the clouds away. And they're all just like, you know, like Gomer, golly. He was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and who wouldn't be? Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood by them. I believe that the same two men in Luke 24, 4, the same two men that appeared to the ladies at the tomb in white clothes and dazzling clothes. Same two men. Verse 11, they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who's been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you've seen him going into heaven. Isn't that interesting? Then they returned to Jerusalem from where? The Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem. They were at the Mount of Olives. When Jesus comes back the second time, his feet will land, that's what it says here, he'll land on the Mount of Olives, the same place. And when it does, the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Say what? Zechariah 14, 4. On that day, and the day that it's talking about from verse 1 is the day of the Lord. On that day, that's talking about the second coming of the Messiah. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west. Second coming. So let me give you two truths. Here are two truths. See what you do with this. One... When Jesus comes again, he comes to earth. 
Two, when Jesus comes again, he doesn't come to earth. <laughs> I like to do these types of things. Does that sound like a contradiction? Of course it sounds like a contradiction. But the reason that both of these are true, they're both true, is because it's talking about two different events. Two different times. Separated by seven years. When he comes to the earth, he doesn't he, you know, he comes again, he doesn't come to the earth, he doesn't touch the earth. That's the rapture, number two. But the second coming, seven years later, when he comes again, and his feet land on the Mount of Olives, that's number one. He comes to earth. And we want to talk about that. I'm just getting started on this stuff. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Now keep that in mind. Keep that shout thing in mind. You'll see that again. Well, you'll hear about it again. With a shout, with the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. And that is the rapture. And in the Latin, it's the Latin word, rapier, which means rapture. You know, if it's Latin, it's going to say it in Latin. Isn't that profound? If it's in English, it's going to be... In, if it's in Greek, it's the Greek word harpazo. But in the Latin Vulgate, which is the translation for the longest time, it was the Latin word where we get rapture from. Caught up, harpazo, snatched up away. Together, we'll be snatched up away out of there with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? Not on the earth, but in the air. That's a different event than when he comes to earth. His feet don't touch the earth at the Mount of Olives at that time. Remember John 14, 3, I'll take you to myself. So he comes to earth, he, 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 but he doesn't come to earth in the sense he's in the air. Now, they're not contradicting each other, again, because they're talking about two different events at two different times. At, at the rapture, only believers will see Jesus. No one else will see him. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We'll get to that probably next week. Believers, the true church, are caught up together with Jesus in the air. But seven years later, when Jesus comes again to the earth, every eye will see him at that moment. Revelation 1-7, look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, really a reference to the Jews, and all, the, and all of us, really, and all the tribes on the earth will mourn over him. And that is a quote from Zechariah 12.10. He's pinging off of Zechariah 12.10, which says that. At the second coming, not the rapture, after the seven years, every eye will see him. And those who have rejected him, Jew or non-Jew, will mourn. So for the next three or four Sundays, I just want to unpack this in something that's called eschatology. Eschatology is the study of end time events. It comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, and then ology, the study of it. Eschatology is the study of end times of events. And we're going we're gonna to dive into this a little bit in the next three, four weeks. Now, to understand the end times, we have to go back to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. And, and as soon as I said that, some people said, oh no. We're going to get too detailed here. No, when I talked back in October, October of 2019 at the small group over in the annex, I did a lot more detail on Daniel chapter 9. And I proved a lot more things scripturally and by outside historical sources than I'm going to do now. I'm not going to take the time to do that. I want to mush through and get to this stuff. But I could, I could. I could drill down and take four weeks with this, but I'm not. Right? I want to mush through it. So when I, when I taught this, uh, you know, there was a lot of detail. But I, I, today, I just want to give you the gist of it. Now, keep in mind this prophecy in, in the term seven. The term seven, and we'll get to it shortly, is a period of seven years. This is where I got into detail in our Christ in the Old Testament uh, small group, is that that term means a segment of seven. 
All right, but it's talking about a segment of seven years. So let's dive into it, and I'll give you the big picture, and we'll move on. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Seventy-sevens. Now there it is. Seventy groups of seven. But it's talking about years. And I could, I, when I did this in October, I proved that it's talking about years, not weeks. So 77, 70 times seven. Let me see how we do this. 70 times seven. Carry the one. That's 490 years. All right? 77s are decreed for your people, the Jews. It's not talking about us. It's talking about the Jews. And your holy city. It's talking about Jerusalem. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for weakness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. No under, understand this. And the reason... <clears throat> The angel Gabriel is telling Daniel this is because earlier in the book of Daniel, God gave a prophecy about the different kingdoms. Remember the statue and, you know, different segments of the statue. And they had to do the, the uh, Medes and, and all these kinds of different Persians, uh, kingdoms and the Roman kingdom, this, that, and the other. So Daniel's seeing all this about these other uh, kingdoms, but then he says, well, what about us, the Jews? And the angel Gabriel appears to him and said, I've heard your prayer, Daniel. Let me give you some insight on what's going to happen to Jerusalem and the Jews. And this is it. Know and understand <clears throat> from the time the word goes out to restore Jerusalem, rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, that's called Messiah, and the King James says the Messiah, the prince, same thing. There shall be seven sevens. Seven times seven. That'd be, that would be 49. And 62. 62 times seven. That's 434. You'll see it on him shortly. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. I won't go into why it says that. After 62 sevens, after that second segment of time, the anointed one will be put to death. And will have nothing. That's talking about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The people of the ruler will come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. It happened in 70 AD. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He, the one who, the Antichrist basically, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, for seven year period. He'll, the Antichrist will get into this covenant. He'll make a covenant, a peace covenant. But in the middle of the seven, let me see, that would be three and a half years if I have that right. He will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. He will come in and desecrate the Holy of Holies until the end that is decreed is poured out on him, which is his due is coming. So let me show this to you from a brief diagram and don't flip out, all right? So here is here's more of the big picture and then here's a little bit of the detail. So the big picture is, you know, he gives a decree to rebuild a Jerusalem and then the Messiah comes. This right here is the age that we are in right now and it's called the church age. The Jews knew nothing about the church age. So when God cuts out 490 years for the Jews in Jerusalem, it went up 483 years and then the clock stopped, seven ticks short of midnight, we could put it that way. So then, what happens at the rapture, we have the seven-year tribulation. Here's a little bit of the, you know, remember Daniel said there's going to be seven weeks, that's 49 years. That's from the decree that happened with King Artaxerxes, if you want to read history, happened here, March 14, 445 B.C., and then the, from the time it was rebuilt. But then after that, 462 weeks, 434 years until Messiah comes. And if you do that, 483 years, that turns out with a Jewish year of 360 days. They, don't, they use the lunar calendar, not the solar calendar, 360 days. It comes out to 173,880 days. And let me tell you something. From March 14, 445, to when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a colt, Hosanna, when they received their Messiah, even if they received their Messiah for one day before they crucified him, even that, that is exactly 
173,880 days to the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem. Then that kicked off the church age rapture, seven-year tribulation, and then we have a thousand-year millennial period. It's talking about the, the, the Jewish clock, not, not us. So there are seven years left in Jewish time. We're, we're, the clock has stopped right here. I hope you understand what I'm saying. And then the seven years will kick off again when the rapture starts. Now, the word rapture is from the uh, Latin word again, or rapier, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Well, let's go back there. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the archangel's voice with the trumpet of God, and the dead will, in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive are caught up, will be caught, or are still alive and left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. His feet do not touch the Mount of Olives. Again, it's the Latin word. Some people say, well, the word rapture is not in Scripture. Well, muchas gracias is not in English. It's a different language. <clears throat> One important metaphor for the church is the bride. Anybody ever heard that the church is called the bride? And, and that's why we get something uh, in Revelation called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Because the Marriage Supper of the Lamb is with us, the bride. Let me give it to you, Revelation 19.7. I'm going someplace with this. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory because the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has prepared herself. There's coming a time when the church, the true church, will be up in heaven and celebrate the marriage and the marriage supper with the Lamb. But let's place ourselves back in Jewish time to understand the metaphor of the bride and what happens at the marriage. And let's apply that to Jesus Christ and his coming. Let me give you the, some facts about Jewish marriages. Not ours, back then. And you'll see this shortly in Matthew 25. That's exactly what happens. Let me give you some facts about Jewish marriages. Number one, the groom initiates a betrothal, a covenant. Number two, the groom pays a price to the father. A, and Bill Chadwick talked about this, a mohair, the price paid to the bride's father for the bride. Number three, at that moment, the bride was set apart for the groom, sanctified, set apart. She was his. Number four, the groom would depart to his father's house to prepare a place for the bride. Now, while the groom, number five, was away, the bride would prepare herself. Get yourself ready. You seen anything in any of this? Number six, the bride did not know when the groom would return. She did not know. It was an indefinite period of time. But she would have to keep herself ready. And number seven, the groom returns with his best man and other attendants, and it would be a surprise initiated with a shout. The groom is here. And then number eight, all the wedding party comes out together. And number nine, the groom and bride are united in marriage. That's how Jewish marriages happen. Watch Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like the ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. Foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry came out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. There's the shout. <clears throat> then all the virgins, verse 7, woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, <coughs> excuse me, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Verse 9, no, they said. They replied, there's not enough for both of us. Instead, go out to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. In other words, the first thing was the shout, he's coming, but now, boom, he's there. The virgins who were ready with him went in to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came also. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. The five virgins who didn't go in, they, they knew the bridegroom. They were looking forward to the bridegroom. They gave lip service and all that. Uh, they were looking forward to seeing him. They even called him Lord, Lord. 
Reminds me of Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. But they weren't allowed in because they weren't prepared. At the rapture, half the church will not go. Only the true church that is truly following Jesus will go. A full 50% of people who believe in Jesus but aren't prepared, not walking with him, won't be cut up to meet Jesus in the air. Thank you.